socialist in Alabama must be historically fantastic. Hey folks, welcome to Historically Fantastic, where we take history's complex questions and come up with some straightforward answers. I'm your host, Michael Jacobs. In today's episode, we're going to be looking at the legacy of Helen Keller, specifically the forgotten legacy of Helen Keller. So here's our big question for today. Why does Helen Keller's legacy often leave out a large part of her advocacy? Before we get into all that, how would most people remember Helen Keller? She overcame being blind and deaf at a young age to be an advocate and early uh, uh, voice for the disabled. Um, she famously said that the blind and the deaf need to be educated and around the nation because of her work, blind and deaf schools opened up supporting those with those disabilities. Um, and I think that's the thing we remember her the most for. Um, she's even on Alabama's state quarter, came out back in 2003. That's a big deal. But here's the thing, guys. Helen Keller lived until 1968. In her 87 years here on Earth, she did a lot more than advocate just for the blind and the deaf. She also advocated for workers' rights. Um, she believed that workers should own the means of production. That sounds really familiar. She's a communist. No, she's not a communist. She though was a socialist. Um, it surprises a lot of people to hear that Helen Keller was a pretty powerful liberal figure in the early part of the 20th century and well into the mid century. So what did it mean to be very liberal in the early part of the 20th century? As I start listing these things, I want you to think about how, whoa, these might sound a little liberal today. Um, we'll start pretty mild. Um, she was an advocate for the birth control movement. Um, that's not that crazy. Uh, that is a generally accepted no matter where you stand, um, except maybe some for some religious or personal reasons that you object to birth control. But I think socially, um, it, it's a norm these days. At the early part of the 20th century, if you wanted birth control, that meant you were wanting to have sex outside the means of having a child. Uh, Margaret Sanger was famously an early advocate of the birth control movement. I almost said birther movement there, but um, I think Margaret Sanger knew Obama was born in America. Helen Keller supported this. Okay, so that's not, that's not that big of a deal. Helen Keller was also an early advocate of the NAACP, uh, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Um, Again, today, not that crazy liberal. Um, the NAACP does great work, and I think people across the spectrum agree with what they do. But at the time, okay, we have a, a white woman writing for a predominantly black magazine, The Crisis, which was the NAACP's magazine. So, okay, a little liberal there. All right, I'm going to throw you a curveball here. Uh, she was a member of the IWW, the International Workers of the World. This was a labor union that was far left. Um, they used the same tactics that anarchists used. Uh, they wanted uh, a lot of rights, and those rights sounded a lot like communism, including the workers having control of the means of production. So the fact that she was a card-carrying member to this pretty far-left uh, labor union turned some heads. Here's a pretty extreme one. She openly supported the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. In 1917, uh, communists took over Russia and they became eventually the Soviet Union. This struck fear in the hearts of Americans. Now in a later episode, I'll talk about why Americans don't like communism. Uh, but needless to say, during this time period, which is right around 19-teens, 1920s, the fact that Helen Keller supported it was a very liberal idea. And that struck fear in, a lot, in the hearts of a lot of people um, during this time period. Uh, this was known as the first Red Scare, and, and communism was feared. When America was on the brink of getting involved in World War I, Helen Keller said, no, we don't need to enter this. She was a pacifist. Uh, she wasn't even an isolationist. Isolationists were people during World War I who weren't necessarily against war. They just were against joining World War I. No, Helen Keller said no war, no fighting whatsoever. This is a, typically a liberal idea. Helen Keller also helped form the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union. Uh, this group uh, tries very hard to make sure that the First Amendment is upheld, freedom of speech. Uh, ironically, 
people will point to that as being a liberal idea, but to me it's always sound weird that the ACLU is liberal because typically conservatives are the strict adherers to the Constitution, and the ACLU is the one trying to get the First Amendment uh, upheld. Finally, Helen Keller was openly a socialist, specifically what is known as a Gregorian socialist, which means she believed that land should be held by everybody, but people have the right to uh, earn their own wages. Openly being a socialist today is pretty liberal. Um, you fall pretty far left on the spectrum. In the 19-teens, 1920s, when she was writing and lecturing the most, it was very radical. It was down, downright scary for most Americans. Why don't we talk about this? Why don't US history textbooks talk about Helen Keller's progressive advocacy. I've got some theories. Theory number one as to why Helen Keller's legacy is often ignored. I think that because so much has happened regarding socialism and how close that is tied with communism between when Helen Keller really advocated in the teens, 20s, and 30s, and today, specifically the Cold War and the fear of communism spreading and killing everyone, I think that squeezed this information out of US history textbooks. Post-World War II boom in education and in uh, the US history curriculum, I think stifled this type of radical behavior. Helen Keller is not the only person with that forgotten legacy. Mark Twain famously was an isolationist and a pretty radical one at that. The Spanish-American War and World War I he openly opposed, yet we don't remember him as such. The Mark Twain Award isn't given to the biggest isolationist in America. It's given to the best writer of comedy. Man, Mark Twain is awesome. He's got some great quotes. Um, be good and you will also be lonesome. That's a good one. There's other ones. Golf is a good walk spoiled. The secret to getting ahead is getting started. Also, Huckleberry Finn. One of my all-time favorite books. All-time worst ending, maybe, though. I don't know. My, my English teacher in the 10th grade always talked about how the end of Huckleberry Finn, he kind of he mailed it in. Uh, but, man, it's, it's such an important book. Anyway, we don't remember the advocacy Helen Keller had for workers' rights or for the birth control movement or for blacks in America because at the time it seemed so radical. And writers of U.S. history textbooks remember it as radical and maybe don't want to ruffle any feathers. After all, they've got to sell these textbooks. Reason number two, I think we forget this part of Helen Keller. It's not the image of Helen Keller that we want to look at. We remember her sitting at Ann Sullivan, her companion's side, learning to read Braille and, and, and figuring out words and learning to speak, which is a beautiful sentiment and, and is so important. It's It's groundbreaking but we don't want to remember her fighting for workers rights uh, we don't want to remember her openly speaking for the bolshevik revolution that's not a pretty picture of an american i joke at the opening segment about her being from alabama that might have a little bit of something to do with it she's from a very conservative state yet she advocated for the opposite end of the spectrum politically um, of what Alabama ideals are. Don't get me wrong. People from Alabama love Helen Keller. Um, I don't know if they just don't know about or ignore this side of her. So I also want to talk about why Helen Keller was this advocate, especially as far as the, the working class. Um, historian James Lowen, who wrote one of my all-time favorite books, Lies My Teacher Told Me, um, as a teacher, this book really shaped my perspective and my pedagogy for how I deliver content in my classroom. Um, anyway, James Lowen argues that Helen Keller was a socialist because she saw that the people most affected by deafness and blindness were the working class. Outside of those born blind or deaf, most people that became blind in their life became blind in factory jobs or in the coal mines. Acid gets sprayed, sparks from the steel factory, um, poison gas would make people blind. And she believed that if they had more rights, they could get more help after their accidents. Um, those born into wealth who were blind or deaf, uh, 
They could get help, but she believed that the working class were stifled from any help they need. They needed. So James Lynn was definitely on to something there. So we don't remember her legacy. I think it's important that we do because it gives us a perspective on Helen Keller that helps us understand why she worked so hard in her advocacy. And also it gives layers to this very important American figure. Um, everyone has layers. Everyone is complicated. Uh, in history, it's important that we look at all sides of the spectrum to understand the full picture. Thanks for watching. Hi folks, thanks for watching Historically Fantastic. Um, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Tell me what you think, comment below. Also hit that subscribe button. I got more episodes coming up on JFK, on whether or not America was justified in dropping the bomb. So uh, please subscribe so you don't miss an episode. Uh, thanks for watching.